Jesus and the good things he's done. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jerry, and this is my lovely wife, Barbara. Hello. And we are coming to you live, or maybe recorded, <laughs> from Cumming, Georgia. We are excited as the Lord has given us this opportunity to, to sit down with you and open God's Word and watch as Holy Spirit shows us Jesus like we've never seen him before. Like, the word is being opened to us on a weekly basis. Every week we come and share what the Holy Spirit has shown us this week. And we just encourage each of you to read and study and be prepared as we open God's word that we see Jesus. That's all we want to do is see Jesus and understand and receive fresh revelation of him, mm -hmm. not so much of creative teaching on the word of God. Uh, they would need to go someplace else. They might ought to that. go somewhere else for that. <laughs> but we want to see Jesus and receive from him. Father, we love you. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word says where two or three are gathered in your name, that you will be with us. And we welcome you right now. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And we just open our hearts. We open our spirits. We open our mind. Father, repeat after me. Father, I make place for you. Father, I make place for you. I make a place for you to step into. I make a place for you to step in and fill up and fill up with more revelation of just how much you love me with more revelation of just how much you love me. Well, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. May the word go forth with boldness and accuracy, uncompromised, and may it land on good ground right now in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Side note, just a moment. Would you go to the end table by the fireplace and get the so Romans chapter 13, if you look at the title of the chapter in your Bible, it's uh, the title of it is Submit to Government. It's the first like 10 verses of it, nine, nine verses of it. And it's very interesting. And God, God is a father of humor. <laughs> God is definitely a father of humor because we just finished reading this book. I know it's backwards in your screen, but it's The Believer's Authority, What You Did Not Learn in Church by Andrew Womack. And it's all about our authority in Christ. And now we're talking about, in this chapter, the authority of government, the authority and the power of government. And for those of you who are new believers, you may wonder why or how did government get into the Bible. I and, thought there was a, a separation between church and state. Well, there might be to a degree, but the foundation, the very existence of government was established by God. Can you prove that? One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And also, we yes, we will prove it in the scripture readings tonight awesome. and what is today maybe not every the country you live in but today was an election day today was a day for primary runoffs and so through the course of the last two, two weeks. weeks two weeks we have learned more about christians uh, responsibility in government involvement. and our involvement in civil government and to the point that this morning if we happen to start yawning off and Jerry pokes me to wake me up this morning we woke up at four o'clock to get to the our voting precincts, precincts to work in our voting 
pool in our voting precinct, not necessarily ours, but one in our county. And it was an honor to be able to sit there and help people exercise their right as an American citizen to vote. And this is my, my drive tonight. This is my message tonight as Christians, as believers in the Lord, as believers that this nation and or the nation that you may live in um, was founded under God. Even, believe it or not, Iran and Iraq were founded under God because of the um, Ishmael, because of Ishmael. So the world is God's. And the government. And the government is God's. And so let's learn tonight about what authority, civil authority, has in light of the scripture over us. You want to say anything else? Before Amen. Go on? Amen. Okay. Come on and preach. Ain't nobody leaving. <laughs> preach. So we're going to read uh, through, along with some other verses, we're going to read Romans 13, 1 through 7. And basically, we're not going to read it all at one time, but basically these first seven verses are representing governmental authorities accepting the consequences for doing wrong within our civil life, mm -hmm. within our civil life together, and on, being honored for doing good, paying our taxes and our governmental fees, and respecting those who collect them. You know, the only people, other than county taxes for our property and our car tags, it's one thing to respect them. They're real nice. You get to go up to the window and you meet them. You get to talk to them. But that IRS brother over there, that's really a tough one to honor and respect. But yet did not, is that not what God is telling us right here in the scriptures to respect the IRS? I think Paul was probably writing this letter right here to Peter. <laughs> to Peter. I was going to say to Matthew. No, yeah. no, he was to, writing it to Peter. To Peter about, about Matthew. Matthew. Yes. You know, because Peter <laughs> Peter and, and Matthew had, had some relationship before Peter uh, accepted him in the brethren. Yeah. And the fellowship of, of the disciples. Yeah. Just think about this, guys. J just think of going to your tax office on a regular basis, maybe quarterly. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, we have to make quarterly mm -hmm. taxes mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you're self-employed. And you walk up. And you look at this man behind these bars and he tells you, if you don't pay your taxes, I'm going to take your business. I'll take your boat. I'll take your life. Call you see him for the group around the campfire on Jesus. Really? This guy, he Matthew. tried, Matthew, he tried to take me for all I was worth. For the Romans sake. <laughs> for the Romans sake. Or y'all aren't smiling. Come on. Are you with me? This is just, you know, this is life. Right. This is life. And so, yes, we have to. Respect those that even collect our taxes. God is clear that he set up civil authorities, policemen, kings, think, governors, the whole realm of authority. I think we need to read, read the word. Just let the word speak for itself, I, huh? I, I, I think you should. Okay, Jerry, why don't you read Romans 13, 1 and <clears throat> 2. And I've got it here in the New Living Translation also. So re read it in both. Okay, I'm going to read it in the... New, New, King, New, King James, New King James first. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authority that exists are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror okay, stop. Okay. to good works. Right. Okay, so stop right there at two. Now read it in read it in the you new read. okay. So the new living translation says everyone, everyone every soul. Every so, soul. So our soul is our mind, will, and emotion. Human being. But we by saying every, True. We, we can do the right thing with the wrong attitude and it still be wrong. So right. You're right. You're right. So That's let good. every soul, every person come, mind, will, and emotion. 
and submit, submit yourself to governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have but got punished. We, we need to go back to the soul thing. Okay, because, go ahead. Because God tells us to bring our tithes and our offerings with a grudging frown face. No, mm, that's not what so. he says. He says, you bring it with the right attitude. We, our, our offerings to God are brought with, without hesitation. We bring it spontaneous without hesitation and in obedience and with a good attitude. But Lord knows I have paid taxes without a good attitude. <laughs> yes. Recently. <Yeah. laughs> yes. <laughs> Even the part I think sometimes can come out of our paycheck with a bad attitude. We can look at our, our deductions from our paychecks and go, 20, good grief. 21. You know, but I'm grateful now for paying in those social security taxes I'm, all those years because I'm, now I'm getting to reap from that. I'm, you know, it's a sowing and reaping, is it not? I am thankful for good asphalt in Georgia. I Absolutely. am good. <laughs> Good roads in Georgia, good, good schools in Georgia. Yeah, and all those things come from the money that we paid to our government. And it's, I'll just give you a little insight. It's not all bad. Okay. So, okay. And we're, we're going to see that tonight. Our government is really, truly for our good, particularly the purpose of our American mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm is for our good. Okay, Romans 13, verse one. We're gonna get through part of this tonight. <laughs> Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For well, all authority comes from God and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. So everyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. So let's go and look, see how old this practice is of God setting up authority. This is not something new to the New Testament, okay? God set up authority way back in Genesis, right. way back in Genesis. Remember, Abraham brought a tithe to Melchizedek, king. Melchizedek, he brought an offering, a thanksgiving to the, the king. King of Salem. The king of Salem. Well, the, the scripture I want to refer to in the Old Testament is found in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. And this is where Daniel is um, first brought before King Nebuchadnezzar to interpret his first dream. And it says here, Daniel is saying this, Daniel, a godly man. He was in bondage. Yes, he was in bondage. So he was saying this about a king who definitely ruled over him. Taking him into captivity. Taking him into captivity. Daniel prayed, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Now, I've heard a lot of people take this scripture and say, well, I don't have to take part in government. I don't have to take my responsibility to vote because God is going to put in office who God desires to put in office. It says right here, he removes kings and raises up kings. So why do I need to vote? God's sovereign. He's going to do what he wants to do. Well, let me just nullify that philosophy because God for one, I do believe that God is sovereign. He is sovereign over all, okay? However, he does not take part in something that um, he has given us the responsibility to do. God can only do in this earth what he does through mankind. Right, right. He needs a godly person. He needs people to move. All the stories in the scripture involve people. No. All this, yeah, all this, all these scriptures that we have before us all take took a person to be obedient 
to walk out what God has. Paul, so Paul had to for write us a letter to, to Romans. For us to say that God doesn't need me to vote to put the right person in office is saying that God will fraudulently insert votes into the electoral college. Well, God doesn't work that way. We have to go and exercise our right to vote and vote for godly men and women. We must take our responsibility for who is in office. We cannot blame God for the outcome of, of an election if we do not do our part. Did you want to say something nope. else there, Jerry? Nope. So it's the office that is worthy of our respect and obedience, not the person sitting behind the desk or with the title. It's the office. We have to remember that those who govern are fallible people, just like you and me. They are fallible. They need God's wisdom as much as we do, if not more than we do, right. because of the responsibility that they carry. Right. And we will all do well not to forget that. So going on to verse 3, Romans 3 and 4, Jerry. Romans 3. Romans 13, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. The so rulers there is referring to authority. Authority is not is to strike fear into people who, I'm sorry, authority does not strike fear into people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. I know if I'm driving down the road and I see a police car come up behind me with blue lights and I'm doing the speed limit, I'm not afraid, right? I'm not afraid if I'm doing the speed limit. I'm not afraid if I stop at that stop sign and I see blue lights behind me. There's no fear there because I know I'm doing right. But if I'm 10 miles over, 15 miles over, and I see blue lights coming up behind me, I go, oh, Lord. <laughs> Mercy, <laughs> mercy. Angels cover me something. But that is that is the fear that's that's natural. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's from God. That response is what is naturally put into us because it is got the authorities are to strike fear in people who are doing wrong. Let's go to verse four. Because the authority is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is preaching. So don't fall into the mindset that we don't need police. Please don't do that. We need <laughs> our police to establish and maintain peaceful government peaceful society if you have my notes you'll see there um in the fourth paragraph down the greek word here for servant or minister in verse four authority is dikonos and it actually means a servant waiter or anyone who performs a service denotes a bondsman one who sustains a permanent surveil relation to another and when i read that the thought came to my mind i said you know that's why once a policeman always a policeman they may retire from the force but they always have the mindset of a policeman right once a ruling governing person the mindset is always a ruling governing person because of the the um the oath that they took that just because they come out of office, that oath that they swore to when they went into office doesn't just evaporate from their from their personality, uh, personality or from their mindset. Right. Once a police officer, always a police officer. Officer, and because they have the right to use force and exercise retribution, authority instills fear in doing evil. But the state never was a remedy to sin. We cannot look to government to fix our sinful nature. Come on and preach. Or to fix our sinful society. Say it again. They missed it. 
We cannot look to the state or to the government for a remedy to our sinful nature. That is between us and God. That is only God can fix our sinful nature through the blood of Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins. And so, so no uh, matter what legislation comes down, what legislation is put in place that will always be those who reject authority. There will mm -hmm. always be until the kingdom of God is established on the earth. When sin is removed, then this opposition to authority will end. Yes. When yes. Every knee, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Okay. So the positive aspect, because here in verses three and four, it says that it does not strike in fear in those that are doing right. And it's there for the good of, their, of the citizens of the country, city, state, nation. So there's a positive aspect for the role in government as well. So we can't look at just one side of the coin. The government is also there to promote and protect our peace, mm -hmm. our peace within the nation. And a peace is one of the great desires of humanity. Mankind is always one of the, a baby is always looking for peace. It's, it's a natural desire to want to live in peace with one another. So let's look at Jeremiah 29 verses four and seven. This passage of scripture is written while they were in exile. Jeremiah is writing to the, the um, Jewish people who had been taken into Babylon. And so here they are in captivity. I don't know if any of you have ever lived in captivity. I have not. And so can we even do this not living in captivity here god required them to pray this prayer for the babylonians not for themselves they prayed for the babylonians and so we would do good being free people in our country to pray this for our own nation so jeremiah instructed them in jeremiah 29 verse 4 all who were carried away captive whom the lord of hosts the god of israel have caused to be carried away from jerusalem to babylon this is what he said to pray work for the peace and prosperity of the city where i have sent you into exile wow and seek the peace of the city where i have caused, caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the lord for it Pray for that city, pray for that government, pray for the rulers of that city who has taken you into captivity. Wow, wow. For in its peace, you will have peace. Isn't that amazing? That here Jeremiah is telling the people of Israel, pray for the peace of Babylon where you are captive for therein you too will have peace. That's Folks, submitting to the government. That is submitting to authority. Wow. And praying the best for the authority. Come on. Folks, I hope our country never comes to this, but may we remember these words if it does. May we remember the need to pray for our country if- Now. Now and then, yes. Absolutely. And we're probably behind the eight ball, as the saying goes, in this effort, in this light of our responsibility as believers. We have to dropped be praying the ball. We have for our country. Right. And for those in leadership over us. For as the country goes, so go the citizens of the country. We can say we've seen that played out in our own lives. Right. Paul commanded Timothy in one of his epistles. Timothy was an understudy of Paul. He was um, the writer of First and Second Timothy. It Paul says, wrote to Timothy. Paul wrote to Timothy. Right. I exhort you, first of all, 
that your suppl supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for all kings, and for all who are in authority. So here Paul is telling Timothy, your number one thing to pray in all your types of prayers and intercessions is to pray for all men and pray for all kings who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. This scripture sounds like if we pray for our government leaders, that there's a promise that our city, our states, and our nation will be at peace. Well, didn't he say in, in Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn and seek my face, seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Heal their land. Yes. yes. So once again, here's another scripture that we often pray, but it is tied back to praying for our leaders and our government and accepting responsibility and then watching as God brings about a peaceful state in our government. Mm -hmm. Another example of that, Jerry, is one of the Song of Ascents. In the book of Psalms, there's like 24 or 28 psalms that are called Song of Ascent. These were psalms that uh, the children of Israel would say or sing, mm -hmm. actually, on their way up to Jerusalem. To the feast. They always had to go up to Jerusalem. They were required were required to do this a minimum three times every year and they would sing these songs one of them in particular psalm 122 is a their prayer for jerusalem and we refer to this all the time we refer to this in christian circles frequently um and so there must be something to it pray for the peace of israel psalm 122 verse six okay we we do that pray for the peace of israel but why do we do it come on why does david say to pray for the peace of, of jerusalem and what does he say to pray he says to pray may they prosper who love you that might be me Amen. i love jerusalem Amen. okay pray that they may prosper who love you peace be within your walls O jerusalem prosperity within your palaces you see how he's praying for the peace of jerusalem but not for the sake of those necessarily who live in jerusalem but for the sake of my brethren and companions i will now say peace be within you government seeks to serve and promote the good of the people not the good of themselves as rulers so government also is, according to Romans 13, 3 and 4, is also to praise those who do good and encourage order and upholding the rule of law. Um, one of the, I want to bring up one of the examples of the good that our government does here in the United States of America. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to or have witnessed the um honoring the, the awarding of the medal of honor or if you've ever been to the museum that is located on the uss yorktown at patriots point naval and maritime museum in mount pleasant south carolina if you haven't i would highly encourage you to go there these are three thousand on display are three thousand five hundred and thirty recipients of the medal of honor dating all the way back to the Civil War. These have been men and women who have laid down their lives, done triumphant, heroic, heroic things, not only in wartime, but in peacetime as well. And the very first one was given to Private Jacob Patriot on April the 5th, 1862, right here in, in Georgia, in Big Shanky, Georgia. He was awarded the very first Medal of Honor. The last one was done um, most recently 
was given to Thomas P. Payne. This is just letting you know that government is not all bad. We cannot look at our government and continue to complain and murmur and get frustrated, aggravated. We Let's look, let's have a positive attitude and look at the good the government does as well. And, and you've did, got some links there in my notes to go and see that information in greater detail. And we need to get involved. And we do need to get involved. If you, if you don't like something, quit complaining and get involved. Yes. If you don't like the way things are happening, do something about it. Don't just murmur, complain, and fuss, and whine. I tell you, I had to get up really, really early this morning. Today was on, today was very memorable, honorable, and very honorable. And we'll probably do it again. Okay, so when President Trump took office, he questioned the polling uh, gap polls or whoever the polling agency was. Asked, well, we got this huge segment of people that quote unquote believers that are in the United States. And he asked- Evangelical Christians. Evangelical Christians. He said, well, how many of these people are actually registered for vote, to vote? And the polling group came back it and said- embarrassing. Well, only about 60% of the evangelical people who claim to go to church are actually registered to vote. And President Trump said at the time, don't they recognize that if they would just vote in 700 days, two years, they could turn the tide in America. That's right. All we've got to do is take responsibility, quit complaining, take responsibility, and do what the word of God is saying for us to do right here. Get involved. Go register and vote. We're not telling you who to vote for. Just go vote. Just go vote. It, it, just vote and, and according to the, the principles that are laid out in God's word. We say we obey God's word. Oh, oh did I say that? Did I really uh. have to go there? We say that we obey God's word. Well, I guess we need to put some actions to our feet and actually do all that is in the, Romans 13. If we just do Romans 13, people, if we just do Romans 13, vote, respect authority, love your neighbor, and put on Christ. My goodness, we, we could change society. Absolutely. We would change our homes. In society, we change our whole household. Right, right. So moving on, one more governmental issue we need to address, and this is really profound. This is really, <laughs> really profound. I'm gonna see how many ahas I get out of those of you who have been in church a long time. So Romans 13, six and seven. Okay, so we're moving on. We're about done with the government. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. Paul borrows this writing of verses six and seven. He borrows Jesus's very words. Ooh, she's she's going to preach here, y'all. I'm just telling you. Just Matthew 22, verses 19 to 21. Jerry, why don't you read that? Flip, flip over there to Matthew 22, because I only have part of it here in the notes. Matthew 22, what? 19 through 21. 19, here we go. This is the Herod, um, Herodians coming and asking Jesus a question. It said, uh, do you pay taxes? And Jesus, perceiving their wickedness, said to them, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he just said, and he said to them, Whose image is an inscription 
is this? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Interesting. And here is Paul is telling us basically the same thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs fear to fear and honor to honor. So he got this scripture from listening or from listening to the apostles right. that heard Jesus teach this very thing right. to the Romans. To the Romans. In Rome. Or actually, it was to the, to the uh, Herodian uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. Probably in Jerusalem. Uh, right. But they were but, trying to trick him about paying taxes to Rome. Yes. And so Jesus wanted to know, so whose image is on the stump, on the coin? Caesar's. And all my life, guys, all my life, I have heard this preached over and over again. You give Caesar his money, taxes. You give God his money, tithe. tithe. How right. many of you have heard that preached? Okay. Well, that, I want to I, I, I want to scratch that. That ain't what it's saying. That's really not what it's saying. If so, they would not have walked away upset. Right. They would not have walked away upset. It is saying, yes, give to Caesar that which is Caesar, because that's who's, but then Jesus says, give to God that which is God's. Whose inscription is inscribed on us, on our hearts? God's. God paid We're for made us. in the image of God. God has inscribed his name on our hearts. So he was saying, yes, give to Caesar that which is Caesar. Give Caesar your money, but give God your life. Give God that which is God's. And is God not worthy of our life? Is God not the, should be the king of our life? Just like Caesar is, was king of the, of oh, the Roman Empire at the time. Is God not king of our life? And so give unto God that which is God. God made man in his image jesus was giving the herodians an invitation to give their hearts and lives to Ooh, jesus christ preach, preach. not inviting them to give their money to god or to caesar. no he said to give it to caesar right but he was not telling them to give god their money he right, was right, giving, right, right he was saying give god your life your whole life and then he'll have your money that is not required by the government that is so, so good. yeah that just like it was like wow that is so right because of the inscription that is on our heart mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we are in god's image he bought us he owns us let's he's saying give me your life honor where honor is due giving honor where honor is due so the takeaway tonight out of all this government talk is government is limited Government is not the answer to sin. Jesus is the only answer to our sinful nature. And we need to pray for the government. We need to get in, pardon me, involved in the government. And although God has ordained government, it is not the purpose it, and its purpose. It does not have the solution for all the problems and trouble in society. Only Jesus does. And if we follow Romans 13, 8 to 10, Go ahead. with our instructions to love our neighbors, that will help our society as well. So I, I said last week that uh, we're supposed to live with our neighbor, but I meant to say we are to live at peace with our neighbor. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> so let's go on to verse eight. Uh, says, Oh, no one except to love another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. So does this mean that we are not to borrow money? Oh, no one except to love one another. Uh, you, you could read that into that, but I don't think that's necessarily the, the real, the true meaning of it. Oh, I don't think so either, because in, in Jewish tradition, 
there was provisions made to borrow and pay back. Mm -hmm. There was the provision that a, a Jewish lender had to release the debt after seven years, the year of Jubilee, right. That's right. and debt was uh, relinquished. So there is, now he's been talking about money and taxes, but here, owe no one except to love one another. With an attitude of love, we can live at peace with one another and and not have grudges and not have let love i can give to everyone whether i have money or not to lend them i can give love to people i can give time to people without having any money you know i and i think that's that's the greater picture here owe no one anything except mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to love them mm -hmm. the greatest the greatest commandment is to love and to give it's, love. it's not to give it is to love right. to love others as ourselves that is the greatest commandment and so it, it that greatest commandment goes through every rank of society Absolutely. Had, no one is exempt from that and, and there's not a person who cannot do it because it's not based on our our social status right so oh no one except to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the full complete law for the commandments are you shall not commit adultery you shall not murder you shall not steal you shall not bear witness you shall not covet and if there are any other commandments are all summed up in this saying namely you should love your neighbor as yourself because love does not harm love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law that's right so we have to understand the that we are to love ourselves we have to respect and honor and and understand that we are made in the image of god in order to love our neighbor yes and if we love our neighbor we're not going to commit adultery with them if we love our and who is our neighbor not just the person living next door across the street not just the person across the street down the corner and it's our neighbor is anybody we come in contact with our neighbor is our co-worker our neighbor is the person who sits in the next cubicle if you still go to work and have cub cubicles oh. it's the person that you talk to on the phone you are my neighbor i don't know where you're all located but you are my neighbor you don't have to share a fence with them that's to, right to be your neighbor i mean just i mean it says do not commit adultery how much adultery has been committed over the internet wow i mean it you don't have to be a sharing a property borderline to be a neighbor you don't have to uh, have a gun to steal from somebody you can be it can be done over the internet true yeah um uh identity theft how about fault bearing false witness so this idea of neighbor has extended exponentially because of the capability that we're using the vehicle the, of the internet that we're using right now. So the attitude that God is requiring is to love. And this word love here is not phileo or storge. It's agape. And it goes back to every soul. Attitude of agape. The willingness to love. Oh, Barbara, did you have to go there? <laughs> my goodness the willingness to love others the willingness i've said this before and i'll say it again because we've got some new folks we have to trust god and love people we don't love we do love god but we get it reversed we want to love god and trust people 
Well, I hate to tell you, but as we all know, because of life issues, people are going to let us down. But they'll even in loving them, they may let us down, but it's a whole lot easier to bounce back from a broken love, a broken heart, than it is to bounce back from broken trust. And so we trust God. God's trust is always steadfast. It's always sure. It's always a good foundation. So we trust God and we love people. And in doing so, we fulfill the greatest commandment. That in and of itself is exciting to think that I'm, I have the capability with God's help to fulfill the greatest commandment. Absolutely. And all of the rest of them are fulfilled in fulfilling in, the first and greatest commandment. That's right. Love God, love yourself, and love your neighbor as yourself with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love does, not, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Hallelujah. That's where we're going. We're going to put we're a good. boat. We're going to stop there tonight because Jerry has as much on the next four verses as I did on the first eight. So next week, you have to come back next week, next Tuesday, same time, same place. And you'll get the rest of chapter 13, putting on Christ. Put on Christ. Wow, I'm so excited about this. Lord's just been showing me and giving me revelation about our ability put on christ not putting on faking it until you make it that's not what we're talking about here putting on christ so we we thank you for joining us this evening barbara did an excellent job uh, teaching on the these first nine verses and thank you for the revelation that and sharing with us the revelation the holy spirit has given you on this you're welcome. Right. It is my joy and pleasure. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that your word yes, has God. come to life. Yes, God. Your word has come to light in our lives, and it has given us new direction and how to look at, respond to, and receive our government and also receive the challenge that you've placed before these precious people to get involved with the government and respect them and serve them as they serve us, the citizens of the country. Accepting our responsibility. Jesus, we pray. We pray for those that are in government tonight. We pray for the leaders yes, of yes. the United States of America. Yes, we Lord. pray for the leaders of Europe. We pray for the leaders of China and Korea and Egypt and all the nations of the world, Father. We pray for the leaders that they may come to knowing salvation, knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the peoples of this world will come to know you, not only through missionaries, but Father, through a government that is founded on you and on your word, yes. just as our founding fathers founded the United States yes. of America. We bless this country. We bless our president. We bless these people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We come in agreement with that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barbara and Jerry. Y'all, Barbara worked real hard on this. I mean, I was looking at her notes. It's just very thorough. You can't whip notes like that together in an hour. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into this. So if y'all will, just get Barbara and Jerry a hand just so they know we love them and appreciate them and some of you new people that don't always come. Sandra from Sweden, she's in day group. Dana's new to the day group. Sister Kimberly may have been here, but she's mostly day group. And a lot of the rest of you are regular. So uh, that's, that's great. Thank you for coming. And if you want to join us, get you a good old New King James Bible or whatever makes sense to you. And join us every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, if you are watching this video um, a week from now or a year from now, and you want to communicate with us and learn more about Jesus and salvation and everything from the gifts of the Spirit to deliverance to healing, 
uh, to deepening your relationship with Jesus, you can write us at contact, excuse me, deliverancerevolution.org is the website. And there's a link. It says contact us. Write us if you have questions of Barbara and Jerry. I'll certainly get them to them. Or if you'd just like to join this group, we'll invite you and show you how. Uh, there's also some great prayers on the website, deliverancerevolution.org. Then click the link that says prayers. There's all types of prayers. Prayers for your marriage. Prayers for addiction to food, shopping, deliverance from demons, you name it, it's pretty much on there. So we love you very much. We thank you for joining this. Please subscribe to the to the channel, the YouTube channel. Please like the videos. Feel free to share it to anybody who wants to learn the Word of God. And we will see you next Tuesday, Eastern Standard Time at 7 p.m. God bless you, and thank you for coming. It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Flaming wide these gates, let's see his kingdom.